morning again, Crossroads. Morning. For those of you online or those who don't know me, again, I'm Alex. I'm the lead pastor here, and I am so excited that each of you are here today. Now, one of the things I want to do is as uh, throughout the, my message, I'll be reading different scriptures. And as I do, I encourage you actually to read it with me, either on the screen or in your Bible. This whole month, we've been talking about the gospel, not just the most amazing story, but the greatest story that you will ever tell. Now, if you're like me, there's all kinds of ways you might communicate with people, right? For some of us, we might communicate through text or likes and comments, through social media, through passing notes. Perhaps we communicate with the way we look at someone, right? For some of us, it's like parents, it's the glare at the kid, right? You know what I'm talking about. For others of us, it's the way maybe we look at a friend, right? We can connect eyes and just start laughing because something brings to mind. And, um, you know, I think about, um, I'm so grateful that we don't have to pass messages anymore through horse-drawn carriages or uh, carrier pigeons. Uh, perhaps the closest thing we have to a carrier pigeon today is a drone. Um, but carrier pigeons were never like great ways of communicating, right? They, uh, they just kind of flew around, and, and when the invention of glass was invented, uh, they were really bad at carrying a message. They just go smack. But today we have all kinds of communication. And even though our communication has vastly improved, whether we use text message or email, there's still one group that we have a really hard time communicating with. It's our family, right? So for most of us, family's really hard to communicate with. Maybe it's a cousin or your kid or even your spouse. I want you to think, uh, on a scale of one to five, one being the least and five being the easiest, how easy is it to talk to all your family? Ah, nah, yeah, there we go. On a scale of one to five, how well do you think your family listens to you and understands you? All right, nah, there's a lot of nods, right? And on a scale of one to five, how well do you think you listen to them? Great. <laughs> Not on the other side, but great on this side. All right. All right. Well, I'm guessing for some of us, and, and I know for myself, communication with family is a struggle at times, right? Our relationships uh, with our family are supposed to be our most valuable and most important, but sometimes they get under our skin. There are people probably in our family we just want to punt or kick to the curb or hope that they're not in our family at all at times. I will just be honest, when, when I was a kid, uh, and I, I have a sister, and there were times I was like, Mom, could we like get another sister? Could we trade? <laughs> um, you know, and it's, it, it could be really hard to share with our family about different things. And we've been talking about passing on the good news of Jesus, and that he came and and he was alive, and he rescued us from sin and death, and we want to share the good news with everyone. And sometimes it can be really hard to share the good news with the people that are closest to us, our family, right? I know for myself, it's a challenge to share with people I dislike or I disagree with, and sometimes those people happen to be my family as well. So it, it, we... It's not a natural thing for us a lot of times. You might be thinking, well, how then do I share with my family if I don't understand them or maybe I don't get along with them? Uh, this seems really uncomfortable. I don't want to disrupt the family dinners, right? Today I want to introduce to you Apostle Paul. Apostle is one of the founders of the faith and uh, a leader within the church. Last week we talked about the Apostle Peter. And some people might look at Paul as the leader of leaders. You see, after Jesus came and he died and was resurrected, Paul comes to faith. And Paul becomes one of the earliest in, uh, and most influential leaders of the early church. Sort of like Peter from last week. And Paul was a Pharisee like his father. In Philippians 3, it talks about his Jewish heritage, his discipline, and his zeal was unmatched. Will you read with me Philippians 3, 4 through 6? If anyone else 
thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh. Oh, yep, uh, I have more. There we go. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in the regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. And Saul approved of their, oh, yep, we're going to pause there. (laughs) We went a little too far, but that's all right. Paul was a Roman citizen, and he came from Taurus, and as a Roman citizen, he had a lot of privilege that other disciples or followers of Christ may not have had. Actually, it prevented him from harm at times. Prior to following Christ, Paul Uh, who used to be Saul, persecuted and oversaw the death of Christians. A Pharisee, Paul, as a Pharisee, when Paul was named Saul, he hated Christians. Acts 8.1 describes Paul's hatred for Christians. Let's read Acts 8.1. And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. However, as after his encounter with Jesus, Paul makes a radical switch. His his zeal goes from persecuting and killing Christians to sharing the gospel to whoever, even if his life was at risk. Paul was an exceptional church planner, avid writer. Thirteen of the books of the New Testament are contributed to him attributed to him. Some might say, other than Jesus, he was one of the most influential people in history. He became the chief evangelist to the Gentiles. Gentiles are those who are not of Jewish descent. And those whom, like Paul, who have zeal or zealous Jewish believers were not supposed to associate with. Now, the Bible is full of stories of the gospel being shared in these adventures and wild adventures. But what is unique about today's scripture, Paul shares it, the message with Lydia, a businesswoman. And in turn, Lydia shares it with her whole family. Perhaps not the most dramatic or adventurous of stories, but has significant and powerful implications. Today, we're going to talk about what it means to share the good news. What we will discover is unrestricted love, generational faith, and a family ambassador. Father God, we give you great thanks for today. We give you thanks for your word. Help us to receive it and help us to be, have great zeal like Paul to share your word with everyone. In your son's precious and holy name, Jesus Christ, amen. Unrestricted love. Acts 16, 9 through 12, we'll see how God's love is unrestricted in this scripture. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. I don't know about you, but if you've ever been restless at night, like if you've ever woken up and you're like, I can't sit, I need to do something, maybe watch a show or write or read because I can't sleep. Usually for myself, it's at 2 a.m. And, and I can't go back to sleep unless I write my thoughts down. I have to word vomit onto the page before I can go back to sleep. And Paul seems to have this similar experience. You see, Paul, like Peter, falls into this trance. He has this vision. Here the word is harama, which translates as supernatural sight. Or the commentary says a heightened state of consciousness is part of the vision. You see, this vision causes Paul to be restless. He can't sleep. He must leave immediately. Paul, in his vision, sees a man of Macedonia standing there asking for help. Macedonia became a Roman province in 148 B.C., formerly a Greek kingdom, under the strong Arthurian influence before Christ, 500 years before Christ. It's a Gentile nation. It's, uh, it's a nation of non-Jewish descent. It's a, a nation of high Roman society. You see, they have a pantheon of gods, Jupiter, Mars, Quirinius, are just three of the major deities from a list, 
that would rival Santa's naughty and nice list. Philippia is in Macedonia region. It's a highly sophisticated region with an inevitable history, important agricultural industry, uh, strategic commercial locations, and it has gold. And it's famous for its school of medicine. Actually, it's named after the father of Alexander, site of Mark Anthony's defeat of Brutus, a city that is exceptionally hostile to other religions, actually so hostile to other religions, on the ark as you walk in, it has a prohibition against any other religion entering the city. So Paul, a follower of Christ, nor any Jew, nor any other religion would be welcomed here. But that doesn't dissuade Paul. You know, what's interesting about verse 10 through 12 is by Paul's response to this obstacle or hostile environment, he's actually excited by it. He's like, I want to go. Let's go. God's love should not be limited by obstacles or hindrances. God's love should not be limited by obstacles or hindrances. Acts 16, 10 through 12 If you look at the screen and read with me, it says this, after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Verse 11, from Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day we went on to Neopolis. From there, we traveled to Philippia, a Roman colony, and leading city of the district of Macedonia. And we stayed there for several days. You see, this journey wasn't just like jotting through the store. It wasn't like just going, hey, I'm just going to go next door. This was actually a significant journey, a 130-mile journey. And along the way, it was broken up by two different stops across water. Samotras, an island in the northeastern Aegean Sea, also has a mysterious worship of the god of Caleb, Ke- Kariba. <laughs> Something else to note about this, which is actually really interesting. In Acts 16.6, it's, it's almost like God puts up this wall because Paul was supposed to go what was called Asia and Bithynia at the time. And it says the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Jesus prevented him from entering. Acts 16.6, Paul and his companions travel throughout the region of Perga and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of my Asia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So it's not, it's not as though this vision of Macedonia was some coincidence or random occurrence or trivial trip. This this coincidence did not pass by Paul. You see, God was calling Paul to an area of significant importance with powerful implications. Let me say that again. God was calling Paul to an area of significant importance with powerful implications. And Paul recognizes this. His immediacy was an indication of the importance of God's call. The immediacy of Paul was an, indi- import- was an indication of the importance of God's call. Philippia was a, had a strong Roman connection with very limited uh, influence by the Jews. There wasn't even a synagogue in the area. In order for a synagogue to be in the area, which is a, an area... Uh, a temple where Jews would worship, there had to be at least 10 males. And there was none. And so what they would do is if there wasn't a synagogue, they would go by the water under the sky to worship God. Because then other believers could find them. So in Acts 16, 13, Paul and those with him, they go to the waters And they find several Jewish proselyte women gathered there for worship and prayer. A proselyte is anyone who uh, went from one religion to another religion. In this case, Lydia and the women defied the worship of the Roman God to pursue the one true God. So in Acts 16, 13, it says this. On the Sabbath, 
we went outside the city to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. You see, Jewish laws, traditions, and customs would normally limit this kind of interaction because women in this culture were seen as less than. The value and identity was directly correlated or so with the association of a male counterpart, such as a father, a brother, or a husband. Males were not supposed to associate with women unless they were related to them or marrying them. The Jewish temples even separated men and women. So it's why in John 4, when a Jewish man named Jesus encounters a Gentile woman at the well to talk about spiritual things, the woman responds like this. John 4, 9. John 4, 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. In other words, I am different than you. Shouldn't you be talking with people like yourself, Jewish men? Don't you know the pecking order? I'm not supposed to talk with you and you're not supposed to talk with me. What reason do you have talking to me? You see, these thoughts were probably the same ones processing through Lydia and the other women's mind when Paul approaches them. Notice in Acts 16, 13, Paul, like Jesus with the woman at the well in John 4, does not allow the laws, the traditions, or the customs to supersede the love of God. God's love for you and I and the world is unrestricted. There's no fence, there's no wall, there's no continental boundary or religious tradition that can limit God's love. And in your notes it says this, God's love is unrestricted, free from all, any and all limitations. He is perfect in love. God cannot be contained or hemmed in. It's free from any and all limitations. You see, God's love knows no bounds, and he will go anywhere to share his love with you. Acts 16, 14, we're going to learn about this generational faith and the impact that this unrestricted love has upon Lydia and the area of Philippi. One of these listening was a woman, woman from the city of Thyteria named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. My son the other day was sitting in the back seat as we were listening to Caleb, and Caleb is going through its giving uh, time and asking for donations and a legacy giving gift. And I didn't think my son was paying attention. I thought he was just playing video games in the back. And so a few songs go by and my son all of a sudden goes, Dad, what, what's a legacy giving? How do you give away your legacy? And I was like, what are you talking about, bud? Like, I thought he was playing video games, not paying attention at all, right? But, it, you know, we have this conversation and I was like, pretty surprised that my son was in tune with what was going on. And I kind of get the same impression with what is happening with Paul and these women. You see, they're kind of hearing him, but then the scripture says God opens the heart of one specific individual, Lydia. Who is Lydia? Lydia is from the city of Thyteria, a city that is 100 miles away. It's not far from Troas where Paul was prior, a city known for its guilds, cloth, particularly purple cloth, the cloth of royalty. So Lydia is a wealthy businesswoman. Not to mention, you know, what's interesting about this is the scripture mentions no man associated with her. Lydia has accumulated a lot of wealth in a patriarchal society. She is a powerful woman in her own right. Lydia was most likely in Philippi to exchange goods or offer services up to uh, those of high standing. The second thing to note is in Paul's vision, he sees a man pleading for him to come to Macedonia. And Paul encounters a woman. You see, she's a Gentile, not of Jewish descent. She's also a Jewish proselyte. 
who has converted her faith. In verse 14, it says she is a worshiper of God. Sebani is the word which translates as devout. And God opens her heart. And she becomes the first actually convert in Europe. So in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Paul says that people who reject the gospel or the good news do so because their minds have been darkened. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, will you read it with me? 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Mm, such a good. See, it is the light that cuts through the darkness. And when God chooses to open your heart or chooses to open someone's heart, as he does with Lydia and Cornelius, which we talked about last week, people enter into the eternal kingdom of God. In Acts 16, 15, it talks about how not just her life was changed, but generational transformation took place. Read with me. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. See, God was specifically calling Paul to an area of significant importance with powerful implications. God was calling Paul to an area of significant importance with powerful implications. You see, Lydia's whole household comes to know God because of Paul's decision to go where God was leading him. Perhaps this is the reason why he shut the door on Asia or Bithynia, because God knew that Paul would have generational impact by going to Philippia. Now, this doesn't discount Lydia, because Lydia was courageous and bold, and she responds to the message that God gives to her. She doesn't dwell on the message. She doesn't waver back and forth. She doesn't question it. She just believes. Her response is immediate. Her heart is open to God, and her whole household comes to know Jesus. Not only that, not only does she know Jesus, but it says her whole household knows Jesus. This is an incredibly powerful woman of God. An incredibly powerful woman of God. I know some of you might be thinking, I've been praying for years for a family member. Years upon years. And yet Lydia makes one simple proclamation and her whole household comes to follow Jesus. Generational transformation. Her kids know the Lord. Her kids' kids know the Lord. And her kids' kids' kids will be impacted because of her decision. If she gets in a botch, boxing ring, watch out, because this woman has a powerful punch. Bob Goff, one of my favorite speakers and writers, says, I really want to be a good grandpa. In other words, what he's saying is, I want my life to be one that impacts my kids' kids. Generational transformation. An open heart can lead to generational transformation. In your notes, it says, an open heart can lead to generational transformation. We don't know the impact that one person has. It's actually immeasurable. One person can have such huge influence on the next generation, and we don't even know it. In 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 5, Paul celebrates Timothy's faith by acknowledging who instilled his faith. Read with me 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 5. I thank God, whom I serve as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Timothy was a major character in the New Testament. Actually, 
Paul was a mentor to him, and it says that he had great influence in sharing the good news in all parts of the world. Two parts of the of or two books of the Bible are actually named after him. But here we see that uh, in Timothy's faith, it didn't start with actually Timothy. It didn't even start with Paul. Who did it start with? It started with his grandmother, Lois, who shared her faith with her daughter, Eunice, who then passed the faith to Timothy. And Lois didn't know the effect that Timothy would have on generations upon generations. You see, Timothy became a pastor and missionary, and he shared the gospel with countless people. And likewise, Lydia becomes the family ambassador. In the scriptures, it says there's an indication that the church of Philippi actually met in her house. The impact then moved beyond just her household when it became a church, and it became known as the church of Philippi. Paul would later write letters to the church of Philippi, and we know this as the book of Philippians. In Philippians 1, Paul expresses extreme gratitude to the church of Philippi, the very church that Lydia started. Read what it says in Philippians 1, 3 through 10. Philippians 1, 3 through 10. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for you, all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who begins a good work in you will carry it on in completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, and it doesn't stop there. In Philippians 4, Paul celebrates the generosity of the church of Philippi. You see, uh, the interesting thing about Lydia, she was a successful businesswoman who not only sponsored what was happening in Philippi, but also sponsored uh, Paul in his journeys. She wanted to ensure that the message, the gospel, was shared with everyone. That no matter where you were at, the gospel was going to be shared. And so she sponsors, uh, she helps out with the finances of Paul. And this is what Philippians 4 says, Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonia, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need to the world, but more importantly, to her family. Lydia has huge impact. She's demonstrating the good news of the gospel. She responds immediately. She is baptized. Her family is baptized. And then she doesn't even stop there. She hosts people in her house so that the gospel can continue to be shared. And then she uses her resources at her disposal to fund missions in all over the world. Her impact was immeasurable, and the changes to her family life was eternal. A family ambassador for Christ can have an immeasurable impact. A family ambassador for Christ can have an immeasurable impact. In our story about Lydia and our scripture from Timothy, these people were acting as ambassadors. An ambassador is someone who speaks on someone else's behalf. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God was making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. What's absolutely incredible is that once we come to know Christ, he calls us to be an ambassador, to go and share his good news. You see, God has called you to an area of significant importance with powerful implications 
for generational transformation. God has called you to an area of significant importance with powerful implications for generational transformation. God has called you to an area of significant importance with powerful implications for generational transformation. Amen. So what does it mean to be a family ambassador? It means that our life should represent Jesus. It means the way we live and talk about, it should just ooze out of us about Jesus. And you might think, oh man, my family doesn't know Jesus. It's okay. You can still be an ambassador. You can still love them. You can still talk with them. You can still show them the love that Jesus has shown you. And we can pass on the good news. Perhaps you might feel even guilty that there are members in your family who don't know Jesus. You're like, oh, this is a lot of pressure. I don't know if I can bring them to faith. But I just want to note something. You are not actually responsible for anyone's faith. What you're responsible for is passing on the good news to them. And it's their choice if they accept it or not. Let me say that again. You are not responsible for anyone's faith. What you are responsible is once you receive the good news, is then sharing it with those around you, your family members and your friends, and then it's up to them whether they receive it or not. You see, Lydia's family had made this quick decision and they followed Jesus. But but for some of us, it might take a long time, even a lifetime before our family members come to know Jesus. And that's okay. Everyone in their own time will come to know him. And you might be discouraged, but know that even the way you live your life could have immeasurable impact. Lois didn't know her grandson, Timothy, was going to transform lives. You don't know the impact that you have. You might be talking with a, you might say, well, I don't have any kids, or my kids are out my, uh, my, my house. But you might impact your neighbor for Jesus. And it impacts their kids and their grandkids. You might impact someone at the store. And it impacts them. You might influence someone at, at Hope Academy or YVCS or, or somewhere else. And it has generational transformation. See, just like Lydia, Lois, and Eunice... They pass on the good news to their families. You can pass on the good news to your family. God's love is unrestricted, free from any and all limitations. His love is perfect and cannot be contained or hemmed in. An open heart can lead to generational transformation. And a family ambassador can have immeasurable impact. Now, the last month, we've been talking about sharing the good news. And I want to close this out with this. I couldn't let the coincidences or the parallels between Paul and Peter go by. You see, last week, we talked about Peter in Acts 10. And this week, we talk about Paul. And Paul and Peter both have a vision to do something that goes beyond the laws, the customs, and the traditions. You see, in Peter's vision, he's called to reach the Gentiles, which a pious Jew would never do. It's an abomination. And Paul, a zealous, a zealous Jew, it says you're supposed to, he's called to go reach the Gentile women, which a Pharisaic Jew would never do. Both Paul and Peter have an immediate response to the gospel. And even though it's breaking laws, uh, religious laws, customs, and traditions, they know the power of Christ. Both Paul and Peter are followers of Christ who bring other followers with them to witness the miracle. When, Paul, when Peter arrives at Cornelius' house, Cornelius is a wealthy gentleman, a businessman, a Jewish proselyte, welcomes in with open arms. And when Paul approaches Lydia, a wealthy Gentile, a businesswoman, a Jewish proselyte, he is warmly received. Cornelius and Lydia instantly give their lives to Christ. 
Their whole households are baptized. Following their encounters with Christ, they uh, offer hospitality to both Peter and Paul as evidence of their faith. And Paul and Peter end up staying for days to instruct them and to guide them. By illuminating these two similarities, I'm not suggesting people will immediately come to Christ the moment you share the gospel with them. But what I hope you see is that God's love is not bound by humanity, by our laws, our traditions, and customs, by our division and exclusionary categories, by our political parties or gender. Rather, humanity is bound by God. His love is unrestricted, and his love knows no bounds. God's love for you is incredible, and he will go at all lengths to reach you. He will go at all lengths to reach your neighbors, your friends, and your family. My encouragement to you is to take and think about people in your life who don't know Jesus. And like Paul and Peter, write them down, pray about them, and see where God leads you. Because God is calling you to an area of significant importance, your family, with powerful implications for generational transformation. Who you define as family is up to you. But God is still calling you to an area of significant importance with powerful implications for generational transformation. I want you to hear that one more time. Because I don't want you leaving here thinking, I can't do anything. I'm not a Peter or a Paul. I'm not a Lydia. I'm not a Cornelius. <laughs> right? But God has called you to an area of significant importance with powerful implications for generational transformation. Let me pray. Father God, we come before you. God, we don't know why you put certain people in our life. But Father God, we know that each of us have a call on to our heart. That each of us are called to reach people around us. Perhaps it's our neighbor. And God is speaking to our hearts and saying, I want you to talk to them. Perhaps it's our family member, which is so difficult to talk to at times. And God is saying, I just want you to share my gospel with them. I want you to tell you, them about my love. I want them to know who I am. Don't worry about if they make a choice or not. But let me move in their hearts. Will your heart be open to what God is doing in you? Will you stand to the side and, and let the message pass by? Or will you be like Lydia and Cornelius and open your doors with open your heart with hospitality, receive the message, allow the message to transform you and then bless others with that message. Father God, you have called us to an area of significant importance with powerful implications for generational transformation. God, if we want to see the next generation knowing Jesus, if I want to see my kids, kids, kids know Jesus, I have to live in a way, I have to speak in a way that exemplifies and glorifies you, the God, and your love. Father God, we are sinful people. Forgive us of our sin. Come into our life. Help us to receive you as our Lord and Savior. And help us to live for you the rest of our life. In the name of Jesus, amen.